this last video of the week, I wanted to spend a bit of time talking about the Sahel region, an area of the world that's being arguably the most directly affected by current climate change patterns that we're seeing starting there that are likely to also be felt in other parts of the world, and then also connect it to the Ethiopian example in the videos that we just watched, uh, linking pastoral and agriculturalist tensions to larger government policies and international relations. So you have a confluence of a whole bunch of different domestic and international factors, including um, development spending that can have an effect on the quality of life of individuals at the micro level. So let's start with the Sahel region. We keep coming back to the uh, African continent for uh, several different region reasons. One is, of course, it is the area, as we saw in the first part of today, hardest hit by food insecurity and women and children paying the cost for, for not having consistent access to, to food security. And it is an area that stretches from the west all the way to the eastern part of the continent below the, the Sahara Desert. The Arabic word Sahel means shore, and it's, it denotes a transition zone between the, the Sahara Desert in the north and the Savannah Plains to the south. It's a semi-arid region with a rainfall on average between 30 and 50 centimeters per year. So definitely not the Sahara Desert, one in which people can live uh, productively. And since the Sahel is based on climate as that kind of transition zone, it doesn't abide by strict international borders as well as it does change quite quickly over time. And it covers all or part of 12 different countries. I think the quote here by um, Jan Ungland, the UN chief advisor in 2008, referred to the Sahel region as ground zero for vulnerable communities struggling with climate change from uh, Mali and the example from one of the readings for this week, all the way across to the other, uh, to the other part of the continent. And does the Sahara has impinged and changed on the possibility of people being able to live in the Sahel through its expansion and pushing into that traditional region. It has gone gotten 10% bigger since 1920. So in a century, it's grown 10%. Let's see if I can do that. Yeah, from 2002 to 2003, um, which is, or from 2020, which is really remarkable, the size and scale and speed with which you can see that change from, from satellite data and pictures as well. The temperature has risen by one degree Celsius just since 1970, so almost just within uh, my lifespan or, or, or others nearly twice the global average rate. As we can see, different parts of the world face different kinds of speed of change. The Arctic, which we're gonna look at more in week 12, changing uh, as fast or, or just as fast. Um, there's increasingly variable rainfall, more frequent droughts and storms. I talked about in a previous week that the uh, Horn of Africa is getting more rainfall, while other parts like in the Sahara and Sahel regions are receiving less. The population of Sub-Saharan Africa is due to double within the next couple, uh, couple of decades, which also puts increasing pressure, almost Malthusian pressure, on food availability in a lot of these regions because it is almost entirely dependent on rain-fed agriculture. Only 5% is irrigated, so there's a dramatic effect on people's lives when rainfall becomes more variable uh, because people do rely on it for their for their existence. The agricultural sector employs around half of the uh, population in this region and most of those are small subsistence farmers not getting that incredible crop concentration in developed countries in which you have large-scale industrial farms. Most of these areas are small subsistence farmers that rely on rain-fed agriculture. And you can see right here from this graph, it's one of the most dramatic examples that I have come across in visualizing the seasonal rainfall and how it's changed since 1970, in which you have almost every year, what you have four years with above average rainfall since 1970, with almost every other year um, with lower average rainfall, which just shows the dramatic changes that we've seen just in the last five, six decades, and the temperatures are also growing quite dramatically fast. 
and that is having a lot of follow-on effects on people's lives in these areas in which they don't have that governmental capacity as well as the urban concentration which makes it easier to be able to provide um, goods for people or to be able to import it and distribute it which leads to um, potential conflicts between two ancient ways that people have been able to 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 work to be able to provide for themselves either through um, growing and um, uh, raising livestock which often doesn't happen within a fixed boundary they go where the where the food stock is and agricultural agriculturalists who are based in one particular area and have not as much claim to be able to move according or the ease in which to move according to whatever whatever the weather gives you and so the porous borders in these areas are often quite remarkable and people and and um, resources often spill across the borders as the videos that we already watched not uh, seen the next video that we've already watched and it also shows the the lack of state capacity and coordination both between countries Ethiopia and Kenya as well as within the countries the um, Gibe 3 dam shows the previous prime minister in Ethiopia the new one has had taken a dramatically different turn there was high optimism but then with the Tigray conflict a lot more uh, international condemnation after giving him the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, increasing condemnation. And you can see another example of how a dam being constructed could have huge environmental costs, lead to a whole bunch of people having to migrate non-voluntarily. And there's a whole bunch of really impressive drone videos on YouTube if you ever want to Google the Gibe 3 Dam or the new Gerd Dam on the border with um, Egypt in the north, which is arguably more important for international stability between uh, and relations between Egypt and Ethiopia. But Ethiopia, this with the Gibe 3 Dam, is another example of how these large construction projects that can be funded from uh, far afield can have dramatic domestic level effects. So this is all kind of centers on the shrinkage of Lake Turkana, which is the world's largest desert lake here in the um, pretty close to the Great Lakes uh, region in the rift uh, eastern part of uh, the African continent. And you can see here from satellite photos the ebb and flow and change of the borders, specifically in the north of Lake Turkana from 86 to 2015 to 2019 after the dam really became operational in 2016. The documentary that we watched was produced by the Yale Environment 360 um, website. The E360 website has a lot of great uh, reports, coverage of parts of the world or issues that relate to this class that we don't really get touched on in the popular media that one, that much. And the documentary that, that I showed you was, was sponsored by them. Uh, which I thought you would find interesting. The Gibe 3 Dam was kind of mentioned uh, peripherally with that documentary because it wasn't really fully constructed and operational. But this is um, uh, the dam as it was being constructed. Again, the uh, drone videos on YouTube show quite expressive, um, quite impressive um, spillover effects. And you can see how it is here with a red dot flowing downwards into uh, Lake Turkana. It's in the uh, southwestern part of the state where you have the larger Gerd Dam that is uh, finishing and is filling now up in the, the far northern part of the state. And you can see uh, here the effects that it's, that it's having on the peoples in that kind of Omo River Valley region and a lot of um, really striking connections and calls for the effects on people's lives in this Omo River region, even making parallels to the Aral Sea as uh, potentially the world's worst environmental disaster. Really haven't seen that much coverage of the case. Struggled to find a lot of press reports about what's happened really since it's been implemented, but as is the case with a lot of these kind of 
large-scale infrastructure projects in countries that are facing their own challenges with an ongoing civil conflict in the north. It distracts from the kind of day-to-day, -day, lower scale human suffering and clashes in other parts of the other parts of the state. Um, but it did uh, undoubtedly cause uh, forced displacement for the construction of this dam, kind of like with a number of other kinds of dams, because after you start filling it, of course, it fills in territory behind it where people once uh, lived. Um, and yeah, lots of different sort uh, kind of smaller scale coverage on what the effect it's going to have on people in the Omo River Valley. And you can kind of anticipate in the years since that documentary how the kind of tensions between these people would have just escalated. We're going to connect that to the UCDP data a bit later on now, as well as in the workshop. There was one last report that I'll mention from the Oakland Institute talking about the dam and the implications for people's livelihoods below the dam that with this with this water and electricity production um, agriculture larger scale agricultural production has actually expanded um, with sugar plantations increasing uh, quite dramatically as you can see from the photos here from 2014 just until 2018 and so you have a shift in the kind of uh, small scale production to more industrial farming, which you could see might benefit people in urban areas from having cheaper domestically produced resources, while people outside in the rural areas that are facing these challenges more directly can't compete for either space, water, or um, uh, market share might be forced to be displaced to the cities, as we've seen in other states uh, over the course of the term. Lastly, I would kind of draw your attention if you are interested in these kind of small scale herder pastoralist conflicts. It really is hard to get good data on these conflicts, especially if there isn't newspaper coverage of them. However, the UCDP, the Uppsala Conflict Data Program, has some data on some of these smaller scale uh, conflicts, if you are curious, and it shows the the uh, escalation of uh, violence only a couple times, mostly in the 90s, but then in the mid 2000s. Um, time will tell what will happen in the la in uh, the next couple years as the dam's effects are really seen. That kind of brings me to the conclusion now, when you have to kind of reconcile the micro level effects on the kind of people that we saw in the video between pastoralists and farmers on one hand at the local level and the mixed results at the national level as we saw with the satellite data which shows you how um, kind of like with the co uh, conflict uh, uh, disaggregation and with the crop aggregation sometimes the country is not the, le the right level of analysis to try to get at these smaller types of conflict and that's why the case studies or more disaggregated approaches are more likely to get at where the actual relationships are that if you look at the national level it all kind of washes out but at the smaller scale is where you can really see these um, either early indications of what could happen at a larger scale later on or maybe just that these climate factors are having these smaller background conditions in rural areas in more rural groups that are going to be missing out when you look at the national level. And that kind of leads me to the lecture questions before my conclusion. The At the end of the video, um, which I would encourage you to look at in Vimeo and not YouTube because Vimeo has the subtitles and I couldn't get the YouTube subtitles to work. There's a call for regional response to these kind of challenges because the, the conflicts between groups as well as the resources do cross international borders. However, given the actors involved and in their environment, their capabilities, what regional response do you really think is necessary in order to bring long-term stability and food security to the region? Please leave your comments in Waddle uh, if you are a student in the class, if you're not and you're just watching the videos, please feel free to leave a comment below. And then leading on to that for lecture three, once you've done that, if you can go ahead and go to Relief Web's website in the box, uh, the search box type Omo Turkana UNDP, and it'll bring up um, 
the top result would be an effort at regional um, addressing of these concerns. And I'd be interested to see if you take a look at it, it's just a paragraph long, if that's the kind of regional responses you're thinking of. If so, um, I'd be interested to hear your thought process. If not, what other things were you really kind of thinking of? And does this kind of meet the level of need that the video suggested? And again, given the, uh, the concerns that I mentioned before, if you chose not to watch the video, there's an alternate lecture questions two and three, um, uh, looking at the video on the Gibe 3 Dam from um, uh, the two, 2016. The first question is, what country helped provided critical financing for the dam project? And second, um, what funding agencies or organizations declined to help fund? And what are the reasons for declining? Because I think with international development aid, which we're going to touch on a bit in the last week of the semester, you have certain funds being more fun fungible than others and certain funding organizations or groups willing to spend money to build certain projects that other countries or more democratic countries or ones in which they have an audience that might not agree with what they were doing. So how do you think um, that helps explain why certain um, companies or organizations said no? With that, that leads me to my conclusion and connection back to the motivating question of how are food production and consumption linked to human security and conflict. And I think the takeaways from today are that research, uh, resource disputes relate to water, land access, land use, and uh, displacement, connecting to the themes that we touched on last week. Food production patterns are changing, both where production is possible, given changing rainfall and increasing spread of the Sahara Desert, as well as um, through crop concentration due to this climate change. Food prices can fluctuate both domestically and internationally with substantial effect on day-to-day -day people's lives. We're going to be talking about that more in the workshop. And governments of these countries are forced with balancing acts when developing policies about how to deal with land use and food productions in areas in which there might not be the same kind of established land titling uh, or uh, property rights that you might see in developed countries, as well as the flexibility and fluidity of international borders and population patterns that can make it difficult for governments to be able to control their own borders or what people do within them. And with that, I will leave you to the workshop and discussion about these issues, and we'll get to get to them in more detail. With that, thank you for your time, and I hope you have a great day.